So let's take seats if you don't mind, and then we'll get we'll get started. Just so we, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions and such at the end. All right, um, I am so thrilled uh, that we are all in person again, and uh, this talk has been a long time coming. This is actually. We'd invited Dr. Tehran to, to come join us in, uh, what was it, February of last year? And then we had Delta, and uh, and that sort of sunk all of those plans. So uh, it is really great to see all of you in three-dimensional form uh, and to not be on Zoom. Uh, so I'm thrilled to uh, introduce Dr. Felipe Tehran from uh, Weill Cornell uh, University. Um, and just by way of background, Dr. Tehran did his training at Mount Sinai, uh, and then an ultrasound Okay. Uh, there we go. There we go. A little acknowledgement of Team Spirit. Um, and then did an ultrasound fellowship after that, and then headed to Penn, uh, where he was the associate director of their Center for Resuscitation Science. And it sounds like there became a real uh, expert in resuscitative TEE, started a registry, and has now returned back to New York and very much leading at the tip of the spear around um, the ways in which resuscitative TE may be a change in practice. So um, we are just absolutely thrilled for him to be here. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, John. Oh, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, um, Naomi, and everybody who's involved in this coordination. Um, it's kind of amazing how much, how much time goes into just coordinating these things. And so I'm really appreciative for that. Um, this is a true honor for me um to to be here i was uh i was you know i've been reading literature coming out of this place for for years as a cardiac arrest scientist or uh, aspiring cardiac arrest scientist um and i have a bunch of good friends here and see nick um ross uh Janelle Mooney, who have uh done work in this area so it's really kind of um humbling to to be here and to just see from from within um what you guys have i just spent uh the morning it's um resuscitation lab and i was simply blown away it's uh just hard to describe what you guys have here so um it is um it is it's good to be here i was telling my wife i don't know if anybody here has a spouse or a significant other who is not in medicine anybody how about do you ever have the situation where you forget that your significant other is not a medicine and you come to them with like a joke? Um, that happens to me all the time coming back from the shed or so. I, I spoke with her yesterday when I got here and um, I said, um, got here, it's great, love Seattle. Plus, if I'm ever going to have a cardiac arrest, this is the best place to have it. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, oh, I wouldn't even understand that though. You know, survival here is uh, the highest in the world. Um, so, anyways, um, I don't know if there's much more to teach Seattle about cardiac arrest, frankly, uh, if there's any gaps for improvement. Um, but what I'm going to tell you in this next hour is my perspective on the application of uh, TE, specifically resuscitative TE in, in cardiac arrest. Um, and, and also broadly, uh, the term resuscitative, as I'll describe briefly, is uh, often associated to resuscitation in cardiac arrest. But this uh, modality is, um, I think, finds uh, clinical applications across the acute care spectrum in these medicine critical care settings beyond uh, that of cardiac arrest. So I want to um, actually give you a brief overview of those other applications because the reality is that um, some of you here might not be that interested in cardiac arrest, but might be interested in critical patients. Hopefully some of you are interested in, 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 um, in resuscitating patients in general as an emergency doctor. So I'm going to try to give you what I uh, see as the current landscape of this evolving modality um, in, in emergency and critical care. Um, you might be confused, I, I mentioned still, or I, I put uh, the Center for Resuscitation Science. I'm still really deeply connected to the CRS. Um, as a uh, matter of fact, my primary mentor, Benjamin Avella, who is also mentor of some of our faculty, some faculty here, um, is a uh, director of the CRS, and just hard to describe how uh, deeply influential and, and impactful um, his role in the team uh, that center has been for me and for my work. And so all of what I will present today, even though I'm currently at Cornell, um, it is um, it is the sort of the product of uh, of the Center for Association Science and, and its resources. So with, um, with that, I want to 
uh, to my disclosures, I, I'm uh, the founder faculty member of the uh, Resuscitate Project, a uh, multidisciplinary initiative we started a few years ago to try to advance uh, the implementation of this modality across the UK settings. Um, I also have an educator's hat. Um, some of you might have heard of Resuscitate Workshop, a course that teaches physicians the fundamentals of tea, um, of which I'm one of the course directors. I'm a consultant for Fridge on Suicide in matters related to this technology. Um, um, and I'm also the PI for a registry, an ongoing registry called RT Core, um, where I'm the principal consultant and co chair of the scientific oversight committee. So, resuscitative team, um, I know that is not exactly part of the practice as of today in this emergency department, but it will be probably imminently. I know that. Ross and the team have been working really hard on making that happen. This is actually a picture of the resuscitation bay at uh, Penn, um, where I used to work. And this is sort of a standard setup preparation for a pre hospital, um, sorry, for an out of hospital critical arrest uh, modification, um, as you probably do as well. Every time we get heads up, we're prepared, get gear ready. Uh, and as you see, um, and probably a few, a few recognize here, Jen Love uh, in the, in the, in the, I was going to say in the near field, that's a autism person's way of referring to the images. In the top portion of the of the of the picture, uh, Jen was at the time one of the senior residents, and uh, and she was the leader of the station. One of our other seniors at that time was managing or uh, waiting for the early um sort of role and uh, as you see here, there's actually a couple of things that you'll notice: early management, kind of ready. Um, with the you know video endoscopy, part of the standard cardiac arrest uh, area management, I think in 2022, and you see a, a TV probe literally hanging, uh, ready to be inserted as as part of those um, tools. Um, so this is really very much my vision. I think uh, in in the centers that have the capability, um, T is not uh, only uh, a tool that can be used. I think it's a tool that should be used. I think it's an ideal modality, not. Um, the the second uh, modality after transthoracic, I think, in the particular uh, case of cardiac arrest, um, I think at this point there's uh, plenty of evidence and plenty of also data supporting the rationale uh, to really use this modality as the modality of choice um, as opposed to a transthoracic approach. So, um, and I, to that, and I want to actually start by um, telling you. And one of the arguments that I that I think it's important to consider when we think about uh, T in general as a new modality, as a, kind of a new kid in the block. Um, this is a statement uh, that some of you might share, uh, might, might have read somewhere. I'm going to just read to you that it will be ever coming to general use is extremely doubtful because its beneficial application requires much time and it gives a good bit of trouble both to the patient and the practitioner because it's hue and character and foreign. Um, in opposed to all habits and associations. You might think that we were referring to TE, where right? it kind of fits right on some of the concerns and, um, and sort of arguments, uh, perhaps against or hesitation around uh, a modality like TE that requires additional training, that requires some investment that is foreign to many. Um, and the reality is this was actually from, 19, from 1830s, uh, a piece in the, in the Times of London and this was uh, James Forbes actually describing the first stethoscope uh, that Lenek described, uh, that Lenek invented in this picture. So um, this is really a story over and over in medicine with every new invention, every new application, especially when it's related to new technology that requires. And the stethoscope really represents that. By the way, it's just kind of insane that we're still using this thing, right? Like. I don't, I don't carry one anymore as a clinician. I have ultrasound machines when I need to um, answer questions related to the heart. I use an, an ultrasound system um, in order to listen for um, wheezing, I guess. Uh, it's probably the last uh, application that might be a reason to go and grab one. But for for basically anything related to the heart, it just doesn't make sense from my perspective uh, in 2022. Um, so whether it is, again, the stethoscope or uh, a handheld device, um, I think there are a, a lot of uh, the same commonalities, all the same arguments that repeat over time. And some of the same, um, I think, just come up with uh, the idea of implementing TE. So hopefully over the next 
few minutes, what I want to tell you is not only um, the arguments and the rationale, but also give you uh, sort of a brief summary of the literature, of the evidence behind uh, this application and why it makes sense and why I think it can improve the quality of care of our patients. The first thing to, uh, I think, set clear is what are we talking about? We are talking about uh, TE in the use of, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, setting of critical ill patients specifically, the terms that you might have seen or heard include resuscitative, rescue across the anesthesia literature, focus or point of care. And the reality is all these terms are describing exactly the same thing. And the big distinction here is from comprehensive or consultative T. What our cardiology colleagues, our friends uh, in cardiac anesthesiology do in the preoperative setting. Um, that is uh, a full diagnostic study uh, in general involves 28 views, um, a lot more comprehensive, um, but really the difference in, uh, in sort of the, 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 the primary distinction here is not really about the number of views. Um, if you're going to be using TV for resuscitation, you might want to know as many views as you can and, full, uh, and use the, the tool that you have at your disposal to its full potential. So yes, the reality is that we use probably four or five, six views in the majority of cases to answer most of the questions, 90 plus percent of the questions that we might have. But it is really not the number of views that defines the application. It is, it is really the scope, it's the kind of questions that we have. Um, and it's determined by the fact that it is always emergent, never elective, and it's always, um, uh, by, by definition, should uh, provide data that is actionable that will impact decision making at the bedside. That's a primary difference, and that is what we're talking about. So this is not something that cardiologists do, um, unless it's a cardiologist working in the CDICU or in the critical care setting, um, and same with the with the operative setting. So by way of kind of summarizing this, if you're going to take one kind of you know slide of knowledge out. Uh, there's three primary applications of this of this modality in emergency and really in critical care settings because um, in my in my mind we shouldn't really think about any of these applications with geographical boundaries. It makes no sense to think about things that are done only in the AD or only in the in the OR. In my mind, if it's the same critical patients that we care for here that then make in general care for upstairs. We should be able to use the same tools that will benefit those patients, regardless of where in the hospital we are. Patients don't care what kind of bad we have. They just care about uh, you know, being, being cared for. And so across the acute care spectrum, whether it's ED, ICU, or anywhere in between, it is shock in the center of intubated patients that have inadequate transthoracic windows. Um, and we're going to be answered all of those questions for which we need ultrasound. Procedural guidance, growing field uh, of this modality, depending on where you work, um, growing uh, expand, sort of expansion applications of mechanical circulatory support devices inserted percutaneously from different configurations of ECMO, VV, VA, um, impellas, intraedic balloon pumps, pacemakers, you name it. Uh, a number of procedures that for years we've uh, relied on fluoroscopy, we relied on just um, um, one more technique in many cases, um, and we can facilitate that, make them more efficient, make them uh, safer potentially also with this uh, with this modality. Um, and Codic OS is uh, probably, and in my mind, as uh, you will see in the next uh, few minutes, the the where the greatest potential for this modality really lies. Um, not only we can address some of those uh, Diagnostic questions. Is there a reversal radiology that we can intervene on, which we are, by the way, mandated by the guidelines. We are expected to recognize a reversible treatable pathology like tamponade or a PE and treat it accordingly. Um, and to my knowledge, there's just no other way to, to identify those things other than uh, with ultrasound. You can't do that with a stethoscope, by the way. Um, but it's really not that diagnostic approach I want to spend sometime and most time describing to you, I think the really greatest potential is actually in visualizing uh, the heart and optimizing the quality of the cardiopulmonary resuscitation, chest compression specifically, um, with this unique uh, ability of TE to actually visualize the heart while uh, we are performing CPR. So this is what we describe often as our core views, generally four views that we use sort of systematically across critical patients to answer most of the questions, as I mentioned. As you will uh, probably notice, 
even if you have no TE experience, if you look at the images on top, for timber, lung axis, and transgastric, all those three images really look just like those that you know from transthoracic. And the reality is that they're actually mirror images. Instead of obtaining them through the, the chest, you're going um, uh, you know, from this retrocardic position. So fairly simple to understand how those are generated. And it's really a matter of developing the ability to, de to develop, uh, to position the probe to obtain those views. But um, it is exactly the same as in transthoracic, as far as the anatomy goes. But Kibble View is a view that is uh, quite uh, unique and perhaps the one that does not have an equivalent transthoracic. As you see in this image, we are actually imaging through the right uh, atrium in sagittal plane. We're cutting through the RA uh, in SVC and IVC in, in all one kind of long axis. And this is the view that we use for a number of procedures, as I'll describe in a second, as well as uh, uh, procedural guidance. It is not the purpose, by the way, of this lecture to actually teach you about T or how to perform T's. That just wouldn't be feasible um, in this setting. So we're just going to describe some of these views. Um, and uh, I'm sure Ross and the team will be uh, working with all of you here uh, to actually develop some skills to teach you, introduce you to this modality. So I mentioned it's really not about the number of views, but there are some additional views that we deploy uh, sort of on a case by case basis. One of those are dedicated views of the aorta. One of the distinctive features of T, what makes a really powerful modality, is the ability to visualize the aorta, the, the ascending and descending aorta. It's really frustrating how poorly uh, we visualize the aorta with transverse, especially descending. It's just too far. Um, in, in contrast, if you look at these images here, the esophagus is really um, millimeters away from the descending thoracic aorta, specifically when you see here on top, that is the descending thoracic aorta and short axis, which is kind of rotating the probe, looking backwards towards the spine um, and the lungs. And it's like literally in contact. The descending aorta is like basically in contact with the esophagus almost. So it is um, really a unique ability to visualize that because we're basically dealing with a high frequency probe. Just like those that have that we use, you know, for procedures and uh, surface, um, but it's again more this from that the structural imaging. So, I'm going to give you a very brief um, history and sort of the evolution of T uh, and uh, of focus T and how we got here. Um, it is always important to know the history to know kind of where we're headed, um, and there's a lot of I think relevant things uh, to learn from kind of what has been done in the past. This is by the way an image of a resuscitation in the women's department at, at Penn. Um, that's Nova Penimianco, the division chief um, uh, in autism section. And that's actually a patient that was being put on ECMO as per that standard kind of protocol that we have. Uh, every ECMO cannulation we would have an ED physician assist the cannulation with uh, T, as you see in that uh, example. So if you if you look at this literature, actually, it goes all the way back to the 90s. In 1993, I was 10 years old. Um, Ruda Rudberg, a cardiologist out of in the UCSF, uh, and, and her colleagues did a study actually looking at uh, the heart doing CPR using uh, a machine from the 90s that looked like uh, an Atari, basically, um, and had pretty pretty sloppy images for you know quality standards of today. Uh, and this study, what it did actually is they would get activations for cut out of hospital arrest. They would run to the AD with a machine, put it in, and look at the heart. This study, which you might have not even heard about, is one of three studies that basically provided the foundation for our current understanding of ACLS and specifically closed chest CPR. The reason why everybody across the world does closed chest CPR is in part due to the 15, 16 patients they involved in this study, in a single center study. What they were doing is they were looking at a heart. They said, let's look at a heart and let's look at the position of the valves during CPR. The study aimed to not only just the position, but then they did some uh, hemodynamics, including uh, VTI, as you see, anybody familiar, nine and eight of VTIs through the uh, left ventricular oxygen tract. Those are kind of Small numbers, really small, small numbers. If you did that in a patient um, who's not in arrest, you think of a problem in shock, have very low output. 
and, um, and you can use to calculate the stroke volume. So they did that, they did some pressures, but really the, the primary um, sort of knowledge gained from the study was actually the confirmation of what we call the cardiac pump uh, theory. And that is, there's two models to explain how CPR works. The cardiac pump model essentially says that we compress the heart between uh, the sternum and the spine, and that is the direct compression specific of the left ventricle that pumps blood uh, forward. The thoracic pump postulates or says that really it is about the difference in the intrathoracic and intra uh, and extra thoracic pressures that really pumps uh, blood uh, forward, in that it's the unidirectional flow thanks to the venous uh, 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 valves essentially that allows that to uh, to be the case. But this study, uh, this study confirmed that um, in during the compression phase, the mitral valve is actually close. Um, and the aortic valve, as you see there, was open right there. And it was, uh, that is kind of the physiologic confirmation of the thrust of the cardiac pump uh, theory, that the whole purpose of the closed chest CPR really is um, to, to, com to compress that left ventricle and eject flow forward. Um, further studies after this one actually described that there is a role for a thoracic pump and at this point we, we know that probably both models have some uh contributing factor the the, the active active chest recoil um that we gain with some uh cpr modalities with some devices is actually relying on that uh on that thoracic pump primarily so 1983, this is what was being used uh, for not even physicians, though it was cardiologists. Can you imagine how you know crazy the idea of a cardiologist is responding to cardiac arrest and putting teams in, in dead patients? By the way, fun fact, the same device I used at that time as a mechanical CPR device was the one that I bought on eBay two weeks ago for our lab that we just opened um, at Cornell, this Michigan Thumpers, like circa 1990s. Um, it's the same device, it's like, 50 pounds, and somehow they were strapping this device in cardiac arrest patients and using it. Um, so pretty cool. Fast forward 20, 2008, Michael Rivas, who's um, really kind of a trailblazer in point of care ultrasound in the US, any new application point of care ultrasound, Rivas' name is on it. The guy just went around and described new applications for this modality. It, it, everywhere, whatever you think about, he, he described the first application. And it's always like cases single author, he just do all the work, um, kind of a, a old school approach to things. In this case, eight, eight cases, 2008, uh, first description of emergency medicine uh, sort of application use of ED physician performed TEs in cardiac arrest, specifically demonstrated the feasibility, demonstrated um, the, the clinical impact in those cases as a, again, case series. Um, over the past 20 years, uh, our colleagues in cardiac uh, in, in anesthesiology and specifically cardiac anesthesiology have really been thinking about this uh, also in terms of expanding this really powerful modality they have as part of the uh, operative standard care and taking it to uh, the applicate sort of the out of that um, perioperative comprehensive scope in defining what they have uh, called rescue. And it is exactly the same thing, but in the operating room. So things like using TE for non-cardiac surgery, high-risk surgeries, transplants, it's becoming more and more uh, a standard. Uh, and it makes sense. Why would you restrict this modality only to cardiac surgery patients? So very similar um, kind of uh, approach. 2016, Rob Onfield, one of the um, also pioneers of this modality, uh, friend, collaborator, in, um, um, uh, Canadian intensivist emergency physician in London. Um, their group described the first application of kind of a uh, system implementation of team in emergency medicine and described that it was feasible, that it was safe, that it was clinically influential um, in 70% in, in of the cases importing diagnostic um, sort of um, influence and affecting therapy decisions. We did 50 plus studies amongst 20 emergency, 12 emergency physicians. So really it was kind of a pivotal and sort of uh, landmark work um, kind of introducing this modality. Uh, many studies then follow that example in those, uh, those footsteps uh, in, in the United States. In the ICU over the last uh, again, 20, 15 years, um, it has also been um, growing uh, sort of adoption of this modality as application that uh, can find place, can find utility in critical care applications. Um, the group out of Northwell, Paul Miller, who maybe, maybe you've heard of, Mangala, 
uh, um, Seth Corning and, and others very well known in the critical care sphere, uh, they really sort of uh, pioneer the implementation of this. And I'd say today there's probably several dozen uh, uh, ICUs of different kinds, CQs, MQs, that use T as part of their standard practice or intensivists perform them as part of their humanic modeling, as part of their, um, as part of their uh, toolkit. In 2017, in a pretty forward-thinking uh, kind of move, ASAP actually published these uh, policy, these guidelines, uh, essentially describing and endorsing that this modality is actually the modality of choice um, and the ideal modality for cardiac arrest. And it is really this uh, guideline that I think kind of really uh, proposed uh, a lot of the work that has happened since then um, in, in the US. Uh, as a kind of brief summary of what those uh, guidelines stated, they described what the goals of a resuscitative team would be in cardiac arrest. And so you see very much um, similar indications or questions that you're asking were turned thoracic, which is characterizing type of uh, myocardial activity, identifying um, pericardial uh, presence of effusion, um, and, and trying to identify the virus or immunology. Um, in 2019, a couple of studies, including this one by the Utah group, described um, actually for the first time the potential that we could not only uh, have a diagnostic role for this modality, finding pathology, but also potentially improve the quality of the resuscitation by improving what's called chest compression fraction, essentially. Chest compression fraction essentially the time that we spend on the chest. Um, and the, uh, the study was very simple, a retrospective study that looked at video recordings of resuscitations and, comp and compared, compared cases that had been managed with TTE versus that those that had been managed with TE. And no surprise, the chest compression interruptions in the group that had been managed with TE were significantly short, approximately nine seconds average, compared to those cases that had been used TTE, which shockingly um, had an average of 19 seconds. Not only that's past the 10 seconds of recommend, you know, recommended by guidance, but just an eternity, like a really, really long time. And we, we have uh, knowledge from many other studies that uh, time really flies when we're doing intervention, especially in cardiac arrest. So really uh, kind of also people work in that describe the potential of this modality also uh, showing improving um, the quality of cardiopulmonary resuscitation by decreasing those pauses. And it makes sense, right? We put this for in, and literally immediately you have an image. There's no time wasted in developing this image. There's no time wasted in Wrestling, you know, so there's no need to put gel in that chest that will then make more complicated to compress that heart. Um, and you'll fight with whoever's doing chest compressions, you'll be in the way of you know defibrillation, and so on and so forth. Um, our team actually back at Penn in 2019 did the first prospective study evaluating the use of the systematic use of T in out of hospital cardiac arrest population. Um, and among other things, described the prevalence of this phenomenon that ever since I've been really kind of captivated by interested um, in studying, um, and that is the compression of the left integral alpha tract. The fact that um, out of uh, 33 patients that we evaluated with TE, we found that basically in 53% of those uh, patients, the initial side of, of compression um, under TE uh, visualization was the left ventricle alpha tract or the aortic root. So that less than 50% of patients actually had their left ventricle being compressed. And to me, in my mentors, this was really kind of a big deal because imagine there are 400,000 cases of cardiac arrest in, in, the, in the US, Roughly five, ten percent of those survived hospital discharge, uh, especially in non-shovel ribbons. That's a lot of opportunity to to improve uh, outcomes. If it, you know, ten percent of these patients could be uh, could could actually be moved from that category, where apparently, evidently, um, the the quality or CPR is essentially not being effective at all on them. Um, it doesn't have to be the full 50%, even within 10% of those patients, we actually go from doing nothing for them to actually delivering high quality CPR that really uh, translates into full flow. In my mind, this was just the simple math make uh, made a lot of sense. Um, in 2020, our group 
um, with a number of collaborators from other specialties, actually, Publicis Pisa is a um, really good organized kind of comprehensive review of the evidence at that point of T in resuscitation. I recommend that anybody is interested in actually the kind of the literature that I'm citing that I'm not really going through. This is a great uh, review. And as a kind of fun uh, fact, this is published in Jack, which is the main cardiology journal. This also tells you about how uh, times are changing. This is kind of an idea that would have been completely crazy for a so-called mainstream cardiology uh, journal, and they were not only interested, but they actually featured this piece in their you know, uh, main uh, review of that, of that issue. Um, one of the things that we mentioned in back in that, um, that, uh, in that sort of uh, review was um, a set of uh, points for the research agenda, essentially, what were the next steps that this team thought uh, would be important to focus on as research? And, and for me, obviously, this is part of, of the key of the key elements. Um, and one of those was the creation of the multi-center uh, registry that could um, actually uh, produce data on this modality. And as I mentioned um, towards the end, this is something that actually since then we've been able to implement with the help of uh, centers across the country and a few internationally. So um, I will give you a follow up on that uh, dream at the time. So why the SSTDT? There's any you know, leadership uh, here in the room, maybe uh, I'm, I'm not a yeah, skeptic, which you should be. Um, this is kind of a relevant question. So why? You know, it kind of makes sense, but what, what is the argument? Well, um, I think as I, I've stated until now, it is simply the wide uh, tool for uh, the right job in certain applications like uh, patients in, in shock that need an echocardiography study and have no transthoracic windows, we have the way to ensure that we deliver that same standard of care that we have to is to use the right tool, and we have the right tool, and that's called T. Cardiac arrest, as I have described already, we'll show you with some cases. Well, it is simply the best tool that we can actually use for that patient population. So the right tool for the right job. In emergency medicine also, it is really... Um, a modality that builds on um, an existing core of both motor and um, in kind of skills that we that we have. These emergency physicians have really good command of that high uh, hand-eye coordination, um, those kinesthetic abilities, that sensory uh, perception of movement. Um, that is really something we do very well, and is sort of at the core of the procedural training of ED docs and intensivists. So, ultrasound guidance, uh, aerial management maneuvers, BL, NPL, all those things are exactly the same thing. This is an intern doing NPL um, at, at at Penn. So, really, uh, we're perfectly positioned to. to to do this, um, and the, the studies have shown that we can do it well. Um, there's an intern at Penn performing, uh, uh, performing a team doing resuscitation after structured training, a few hours of simulation based uh, training, um, plus a couple of studies in, in live patients. Um, is, um, she was able to obtain the views that we needed uh, during that resuscitation. One of my uh, colleagues and uh, friends, Rob Onfield, that I mentioned briefly before. Um, uh, sort of uh, taught or kind of gave me this idea, this concept uh, about it, which I think is also another great argument. It's a really, uh, it's a scalable um, a tool or a tool of scalable complexity. What that means is we can start with the very basic foundation where we ask very simple questions like, is there a tamponade or not? Is the heart beating or not? You know, stop with this, stop with this crap of I think I have a pulse. Well, like, what is the heart doing? If the heart is in standstill, like, stop feeling for a pulse. There can be pulse if the heart is in standstill. Um, so you can start with those very basic questions, but we can um, also expand the sophistication of these uh, of this question you ask, like human and modern. Um, it can be the ideal hemodynamic model uh, in the in the ICU setting to have a serial, for instance, true volume estimation and, and tailor our pressure support, for instance. Um, we can do transsubdural non ultrasound. The more sort of skills that we accumulate, the more the fancier things that we can do, the, the, the more advanced um, questions that we can ask. So the full spectrum of that builds critical care echocardiography. I took the first um, Sort of a generation of the critical, the new critical care echo board exam. It's a fantastic test for anybody here interested in sort of advanced critical care applications that are relevant to the ED um, environment as well. Uh, that 
with respect to uh, any uh, of emergence of, of critical care echolography involves um, very very clearly the, the the use of this modality of T. So this is another um, another uh, argument that I think is really strong. Is the idea that the largest benefit for our patients is actually in the early portion of this learning curve. That if you get the very basic, if you're able to get a full chamber view, you will probably help be able to help and change uh, significantly the quality of care of your cardiac arrest stations with the very basic uh, of this learning curve. This um, image uh, acquisition is no, not a problem. I don't know if you've thought about this, but I mean, you know, Dr. Sheehan was here as an educator in this in this modality in, in echolography for years. I, I trained fellows and residents in ultrasound. We spend weeks teaching people how to develop transthoracic windows. You might think that is like you know a few hours. But it's not. It takes weeks to actually understand how to develop transthoracic images because it's goddamn hard. It's actually difficult to get good at, at finding those web spaces, finding the position, really fine motor control. Um, in contrast, transophageal echo, really image acquisition, not a problem. You will literally get an image just for showing up. Um, and um, similarly, the fact that this tool is, this um, uh, probe is in the esophagus, kind of out of the way, um, is, is an ideal um, situation for serial uh, reassessments. One of the things that I never liked about transthoracic is that we would kind of get snapshots of information. And as a critical care minded physician, I don't like snapshots. I like a full story. I don't like still photography. I like video. I like film. I want to know what happened with this patient over eight hours. So I, I can do that with transophageal echo and, and build that story over time, look at that heart over time, have my colleagues, have the nurses look at uh, that uh, T image over, over time um, as an additional cardiac monitor, essentially. That is um, uh, a unique uh, ability. And this is actually something that John Lou Vincent um, and uh, the French school <laughs> know things in critical care and in, in medicine in general. They've been doing for 20 plus years, and we like in the US to take credit and you know and pretend that we invented things, but Europeans have been really uh, doing many of these things for years. This is one of those uh, situations. Uh, Echocardiography and T has been implemented, and we've actually uh, described it as in this piece um, as an ideal humanity monitor. It's a, a really beautiful kind of review where it compared to other standard monitoring. Uh, techniques in the ICU setting. So what is actually T impacting here? How and, and, and kind of when? I, I want to give you some concrete examples. Um, if we sum this up, we kind of summarize it. In, T, uh, in the case of shock, we have these four applications. And this is, again, very similar to those that you have with transthoracic. In cardiac arrest, as I mentioned, improving CPR quality is the one that really um, just is not possible with transthoracic, so it's the one that I'm going to center and, and spend uh, the next few minutes describing because it's what I think is really uh, the again the greatest potential. Shock hemodynamics, just a word on this: uh, patient over 600 pounds, sign out to me in the EDICU that I worked at Penn uh, as a septic shock. Um, Long story short, T in place after several hours of care, transthoracic windows unavailable. Did a T. Um, you don't have to be an expert in echocardiography to understand that this is not a heart that uh, the heart that you would expect in septic shock in a young-ish patient. Um, you would expect to see a normal heart trying to compensate for that vasodilation. So there's a clear example where this was not septic or pure septic. This was like there's a component of a cardiogenic uh, macular dysfunction clearly, likely in the center of sepsis of this patient. So really changing the management, we're not going to go and flood that patient with fluids the same way that it was just purely um, vasodilation from you know distributed distributed shock in the center of sepsis. Um, case of a post ablation complication patient came in hypertensive after getting fluids for a while in the ED, uh, getting worse, requiring intubation. This is the first image that one of the residents get. So again, kind of smoking gun right there and then changing uh, management. Patient with COPD, lung emphysema is really good enemy of transthoracic, unfortunately. We can't really see through the lung with all that air. Um, and so case like this, patient that came in, again, performing hypertensive, arrested, got out of the rest, uh, PE, um, Smoking gun immediately in the first view, no um, no questions about what was driving that patient's shock. 
RV looks rather static. We don't need to do any fancy, you know, tapsy or anything. Visually, it looks dilated, and we are literally seeing uh, part of a problem there. We were caught. Um, this is actually a case that I had during the pandemic, early part of the pandemic, when we thought that everybody in cardiac, in cardiac arrest was actually having cardiac arrest from respiratory failure. It's one of the cases where we demonstrated in real time that, in contrast to what we knew at the time, this patient actually a young female had uh, a PE, which later confirmed got uh, lost with treating thrombolytics and, and survived. Um, that example, um, again, this case would have not been possible, probably. This would have, would have, we would have not been able to make that diagnosis uh, with transthoracic. This uh, lady had no transthoracic windows. Um, and uh, again, in this case, this uh, intracardiac thrombus on the right side was sort of the clue in the setting of the right uh, site dilation uh, for P. And this is later, months after that, we learned that we all turns out that a lot of the COVID patients actually had um, clots, and, and that became a lot more clear. Syncope, PRS, high quality CPR, nobody, nobody knew what else to do. Trends of high quality CPR, first T image shows this large occlusive thermos in the RA. It's a good example of how um, we can identify certain patients where we need to deviate from the standard ACLS. There's just no epinephrine and no high quality chest compression, so we'll get that patient lost until we deal with that large occlusive thrombus. Um, and then last but not least, one of the really unique uh, features of T is the ability to visualize the aorta, as I mentioned. This is uh, the, the same thoracic aorta. We can identify acute aortic syndromes uh, really well with that. Um, this gives a, a type A dissection, or I guess A and B, um, that had led to a VFRS, actually. Hemolytic modeling and specifically preload tolerance assessment or flow responsiveness. Uh, many of you have been taught uh, to evaluate the IBC. Essentially, it's the same as tossing a coin, like kind of 50% of being right. Um, with the SVC, we don't have the intra abdominal pressure uh, issues that really make the IBC system so bad. With the SVC assessment, uh, according to some studies in, in Europe and ICU saying, it's very clear that greater uh, than 36% variation of the diameter of the SVC predicts flu response and it's really well. Uh, this is one of the things that we use to for in our EDAC uh, ICU. Um, in the past. Procedural guidance, I mentioned that a number of procedures can be optimized, troubleshooted with T, uh, probably one that you're familiar with already in this setting um, is ECMO. If you've experienced any of these cases, it's rather difficult to identify, to distinguish between your vessels, femoral vein and artery look kind of the same, both are pulsatile. Um, we had a number of cases at Penn uh, a few years ago where in the setting of ECVR accumulation, cardiothoracic surgery intensity was strained for their mother, but they had accumulated the artery. As soon as we were in pump, the patient was BV essentially accidentally, and that obviously doesn't work in cardiac arrest. So we implemented the practice of using T as the confirmation um, to look for that guide wire in the descent thoracic aorta, look at that tip as the gold standard for us to say, yes, you are in the artery, you can advance in, uh, uh, in, in, in place at Kimla. On the venous side, with that same bicable view that I showed you earlier. On the right side, confirm the placement of the guide wire on the CPR as you see. See the guide wire, and after uh, placing that guide wire in real time, we can visualize um, again and kind of elegantly and safely advance that cannula. These cannulas are stiff and big, and they're already too thin, and like the walls are thin and fragile. The septum is thin and fragile. After doing, I don't know, 10 of these. I could not accept the idea that cell patients would just get cannulated kind of blindly. Um, and uh, it just makes sense not only for VA, but in VV, I come with some configurations of like some of the newer uh, single women cannulas like the Avalon, um, where you really care about the position. You can put color Doppler and really position, sort of optimize um, the, the position uh, of the cannula much better uh, in where we want it. This just makes so much sense. It, like, again, this is something for which you use fluoroscopy. It, it, in 2022, it just it doesn't make sense for me not to guide it with transoft DRI going could be an example of a zero guidance sort of application. This was a case with uh, of a heart transplant patient arrested uh, in the setting of airway uh, of, of RSI for uh, alternate mental status. All these patients were followed really closely. So the cardiothoracic team was like at the bedside, you know, in minutes and decided to put this patient on pump basically for, uh, sorry, patient with shock, got ROSC, brief period of, of arrest, came out of a uh, shock, came out of a uh, arrest, 
in cardiogenic shock, pre uh, pressures in the you know, 60s or the 30s, and immediately the remote hesitation team put the patient on VECMO as a bridge to survival, next decision. I don't know whether the right term in that situation, bridge to figure out what to do. Um, and as you see here, circles on, and the perfusion is as, as I walked in, because it happened so fast that T was not part of the accumulation. Um, as I walked in, the team was trying to figure out why the flows were like one liter, seemed, uh, uh, extremely low and insufficient to support this patient. Um, so it started kind of this traditional approach Look at the heart, uh, in this case, T, transgastro image, confirm, um, you know, transplant their heart. Um, EF, you don't have to be an expert again, just not a great EF. It's kind of the way Ben Nelson and managers would say, we feel sad when we see that heart. You know, that EF is, is that normal. Uh, all of your T, flow, all flow, that, like really a ninja view where you cut through the base of the heart and you look at the entire right side. Tricuspid valve on this side. Uh, whoop, whoop. Tricuspid, uh, tricuspid valve. For cuspid valve right there, and then pulmonic. You see the entire right side very quickly. We can establish there's no right side pathology kind of driving this. Um, and so the next thing is to go confirm the the, the position, the, the presence of those cannulas. Go to the right side to do that same bicuvial view that I showed you earlier. This is the right uh, atrium right here. SVC this way, IVC that way. I would be expecting to see my the tip of the venous cannula there. I mean, there's a central venous catheter there coming from the SVC. There's no cannula from ECMO. So very common problem we do in that case. Advance the program further in, just simply uh, into the intrapodic portion of the IVC. And there it is, the tip of the cannula. We simply just not advance far enough. We're just having kind of suction in the intrapodic portion of that IEC. Really somewhat common kind of mechanical problem. The, the problem there uh, was quickly fixed. We confirmed that it was Doppler, uh, there was flow through that tip. There's no other mechanical problem. That cannula was advanced into the, uh, the RA SVC junction when we wanted it, and the problem was fixed. So, uh, and the flow is improved. And so, this is an example of how we can. Um, this was an emergency physician performed T at the bedside, really changing the, the management in that patient uh, immediately. The alternative would have been to take that patient to the OR problem and do floral, um, but that maybe would have happened too late, potentially. So again, example of collaboration, interdisciplinary um, sort of skills uh, brought to the table. And I want to close with the cardiac arrest sort of uh, application, some of the examples that uh, I think really um, in my mind, uh, present the greatest opportunity. Very quickly, one of those opportunities is optimizing the depth. This is uh, something that seems perhaps um, counterintuitive, but the idea that we compress at the same depth to all patients, regardless of your size and the type of your chest, that just makes no sense in my mind. And with T over the past few years, we've learned that in many cases like this one, the compressions are delivered in the right position, but they don't actually provide enough depth such that the left ventricle is compressed. That is the left ventricle and it's kind of uncompressed, just not enough. In total CO2, 11, best survey we have of coordinate perfusion pressures, kind of cardiac output, intra arrest, think about it in those terms. Not a great one, but the best we have, non invasive very reliable, confirming that we were essentially not getting good for a flow. As we um, can you know, identify that, we, we remove the mechanical CPR device and move on to manual, we appreciate that when manual is started, there's a lot more bouncing. We see those all the time. There's, there's no regular vector, right? You're like kind of like bouncing as you deliver those manual compressions. So what we do in that case is under real-time guidance, we're literally adjusting, tailoring how deep those compressions should be. And that just makes so much sense, right? You're literally seeing that early now that would be described in the 90s, and then seeing it open more, and then, and then, then visualizing the entire CO2 going up, Dive store blood pressures have had an England problem with going up as well as a uh, sort of um, a, uh, as a correlation of the coronary perfusion pressures. So, um, you know, for, uh, um, fast forward three, four minutes um, after making that change, and CO2 has continued to go up as we optimize that depth, um, reaching 32. And as expected, once you have uh, that level of mycorrhizal perfusion, uh, that patient gained ROSC. This is an example where the area of compression was right, but the depth was just not right. So in my mind, this represents really a change in paradigm, potentially, where some of the patients to whom we are offering standard CPR might just not be benefiting at all. 
And if you told me that CPR was getting 100% of your patients back, well, I would say I have nothing to say. But the reality is, unfortunately, that that's not how it works, is that the minority of patients in whom we do chest, CP, chest compressions, close chest CPR, close chest compressions, actually survive. So that's a before and after, left and right, um, of that kind of optimization of the uh, death. And in a similar kind of angle, we can also identify certain cases, as I mentioned, uh, from the work I have done a few years ago, and not only identify the compression death or optimize it, but actually look at the actual um, side of compression, that is the area of maximum compression. Essentially, during the compression phase, we would want to see that aortic valve open. As you see in this 2D image, the aortic valve is being compressed. It's an example of LVOT obstruction during the compressions. How does that look in 2D image? Um, that would be an example of LVOT compress and LVOT not compressed after doing some kind of fine uh, movement of the uh, of the chest compression location. You may say, well, I don't actually agree that that's, you know, a thing, um, or that compression of the LVOT does anything. Um, this is actually the same patients in a transgastric review. That's a reference interval. I'm not a physicist, but I know that in order to generate a change in pressure, you need to change volume. And if you look at that left ventricle, any diastolic pressures or, or in diastolic volume, in diastolic diameter, are probably the same as the in systolic. There's like literally nothing happening to that left ventricle. Um, what happens when we do this? Even more proximal compression of the aortic root. Um, I wonder if maybe this is actually good. Maybe this actually gives you better coronary perfusion. This is one of the questions that we're asking uh, intending to answer in the lab, uh, in the laboratory setting. And there's actually good evidence already, uh, mechanistic evidence supporting this idea. You can tell from their team did animal uh, studies in the 16, 17, essentially demonstrating when you randomize uh, pigs to compressions over the LV versus uh, LVOT, you just don't get ROSC when you compress LVOT. That's simple. For me, this was really um, kind of a, a major uh, driver in the motivation to study this further, to further characterize. This is what I mentioned earlier. I will go let me say that not only this happens, but it actually happens often. So this phenomenon is quite prevalent and potentially therefore a high value target. For another study that year, Katina out of Milan in the group in the ECPR population demonstrated for the first time the link between the obstruction uh, of the LVOT or actually the opening of the LVOT with short term survival. So, this is the first time we had a link of these two, no quality evidence, uh, but nevertheless uh, pointing in the same uh, direction. As I mentioned, Jimmy Fair and their group had, mentioned, had published already a study demonstrating the potential to decrease the duration of chest compression um, pauses. A number of other applications have been described. Our team described uh, application of T in the trauma setting, which is another aspect that I'm interested in, specifically uh, blunt thoracic uh, trauma traumatic injuries, identify identification of those injuries in decision making for pair up for operative care. It just makes sense. You can you know uniquely uh, sort of uh, unique ability to visualize the aorta uh, with this with this modality. Uh, prone ventilation, a group described this during the pandemic actually. In the time where some cardiologists community was essentially were advocating or promoting basically to shut down OTs and OT uh, practice. Um, and we argue that in the ICU setting, specifically in those patients with refractor hypoxemia that we're managing in prone ventilation, it is actually ideal to evaluate those patients when they need an echo with T. And there's been a number of studies demonstrating um, that. Uh, Transsophageal lung ultrasound, or TLS, described by Andrew Mimov in their Canadian group. Um, another example of uh, how kind of the versatility of this modality can look back and look at the lungs and do exactly the same type of uh, investigations that we've done with transthoracic. Um, this group uh, um, out of London actually um, did a uh, sort of tailoring of recruitment maneuvers, which is something that you might not feel maybe strong about, but if you are, this is something that has I mean, another application. Um, I'm going to skip the part of uh, training competency and how we get uh, kind of how we achieve competency in terms of um, like number of scans, because I think it's 
uh, probably not necessary for this discussion. Um, question of tea uh, safety. The bottom line is that there's been a number of studies in other environments, not ED of critical care, where um, essentially we have confirmed that there is a relatively very low uh, percentage of complications or clinical relevant complications, specifically uh, esophageal perforation is the one that we are um, that we're always more concerned about. We have to put that into context. And the context is specifically that if you have a, a patient that is dead, you are trying to make that patient undead, then it's in that context that we need to evaluate and assess the you know the risk. Um, to that end, though, we have uh, just uh, presented at the abstract at ASAP two days ago the data from the first almost 500 patients in a multi-center uh, registry, uh, essentially confirming the lack of of clinically relevant complications. I'll mention that in the last slide. Um, how do I implement it? We're also going to spend uh, skip this because. I think you have local champions that will uh, tell you how to do this, um, and in the next uh, in the next few months they bring this to you. Um, I want to plug uh, the Resuscitate Collaborative Registry, this uh, multi-center operation that we have started, in that I mentioned we presented uh, data last uh, this uh, last weekend at ASAP. Um, we are studying five indications: uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest, in hospital procedural guidance, and um, Assessment patients in shock. Um, we are um, essentially bringing together all the centers that are using this modality, both in ED as well as ICUs, and who, we have built an infrastructure to uh, gather that data, process that data, and make it accessible. Um, pretty much uh, mirroring and really following the example of the ELSO registry, literally, we just like run and sat down with them and asked them. For the secret sauce. Um, we did the same with uh, the Aorta registry, with Get With the Guidelines, and kind of like learned uh, from those registries and implemented something very similar. Um, this is the architecture of that set. You can actually get this online if you're interested. But as you see, really what makes this uh, unique, the service should be unique, is that not only we're studying uh, findings of T, uh, as, as it is, for instance, in the, in the case of cardiac arrest, but we're actually gathering all the other data that is critical to understand the impact. Specifically in cardiac arrest, the big problem is often in ultrasound studies, we will get all excited about the ultrasound findings and have no idea about the initial rhythm, pre hospital interventions, downtime, no flow, so on and so forth. This registry is capturing all that data, all the outstanding variables for cardiac arrest that will allow us to actually analyze outcomes um, that is we were capturing. So we presented uh, the first two analysis at ASIB, we're presenting the first outcomes related study at last next month, uh, which I'm very excited about, essentially, and kind of spoiler alert. We've confirmed in a large number of patients, multi single perspective, that after controlling for other confounders for other variables, the presence of left ventricular off obstruction obstruction is associated to lower uh, percentage of risk. Not a shocking finding, but again, for the very first time, we have high, high required data uh, with all controlling for all the confounders. So there is there there. The next step is to have enough patients are stretched from the hospital to be able to link that to actually clinical relevant outcomes. So um, this is actually a, a map of uh, a graph of the kind of trend that you see of the enrollments. As so of right now we have 510 cases, which I'm very, I'm very uh, proud of and uh, thankful and grateful for the group of all the centers collaborating um, as all of you know here, it is a uh, it takes uh, an army to really make anything like this happen, and it's been uh, an incredible experience over the last year. This is just a breakdown of the indications. We have a fairly kind of a split between the applications, even split, especially intro rest and shock. This is probably kind of a, a sign or a reflection of the type of units we have participating, primarily EDs in ICUs. Um, as you see here, TE remains uh, 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 a driven intervention or application as one would expect in this uh, era. And, um, and this is probably the, one of the most important pieces of data that we have so far. Um, there's been no software professions and probably essentially no clinical relevant uh, complications in this large cohort. So um, hopefully this data, uh, once we publish, will be the, I think, the, the kind of definitive um, Data and safety of this modality in the right population of patients that we have. Um, 
the critical less uh, data, one quick little thing to, to show you is, as we predicted, the diagnostic findings, the prevalence of diagnostic findings is actually not very significant. It's very uncommon that we find a smoking gun with uh, ultrasound in general. And that actually confirms actually what was probably the experience of all of you. Do you remember the last time that you found a smoking gun in a critical rest patient and had something to injure on? Probably not. I don't remember. It almost never happens. So the reality is, unfortunately, most cardiac arrests, non shock and rhythm arrests specifically, all we really do is buying time for our patients. And the best we can do during that you know, buying time uh, phase is to deliver high quality CPR. And if we determine that high quality CPR is not doable, then maybe to put patients on ECMO or another form of uh, support or stop the resuscitation. That is uh, kind of how I see this. So a lot more uh, sort of numbers describing essentially that this is a, a, a sample that is uh, fairly consistent and representative of other large cardiac arrest studies. Uh, interesting finding, we have prevalence of mechanical CPR. 47% of the centers uh, are using kind of CPR. This probably has, I think, implications in, in this question of uh, chest compression location and kind of what is optimal compression um, sort of physiology. So a lot of interesting opportunities. Um, uh, these are the outcomes so far. Again, we haven't had enough patients to search from the hospital to be able to, to be powered for outcomes, but they will be there. The estimate is that we'll have 2,000 patients in this registry within another um, 18 months if we keep them going at this rate. And that will allow us to, to do that uh, for the first time. So, if anybody's interested in more um, kind of information, the SSDT Projects uh, website is a great resource for that. Um, with that, uh, this is my email, it's my Twitter handle. Um, I thank you for your attention and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Do we have time? Okay. Yeah. Ross, I promise this, this has not been prepared. This is a spontaneous question. Great question. What do you want to What do you want to say? We're on time, right? So, so that's a kind of a million dollar question, right? And and I look at you know Janelle and uh, and Luke here because I think this is this is not the first time that we implement a new thing, right? Like implementing a new modality, a new intervention. In this case, a diagnostic modality. It's not a therapy. Um, it, it it is challenging. A lot of factors. Uh, to consider. Um, short answer, though, is I think there's two approaches. The approach that most of us have followed in the four centers that I've helped implement in, as well as most of the other ones around the country, is being to start with a small group of trained individuals that will act as champions and then expand uh, in, in sort of subsequent phases the halo of people that kind of get. Uh, training and credential. Um, what makes the most sense, at least from my perspective, for those initial champions are ultrasound faculty, then uh, probably co-control faculty in that same uh, category, um, obviously fellows in those camps. And, um, and as you expand, then uh, start to reach or sort of open it to more faculty. The reality is, and I'll not just mention the other side of the spectrum is what um, Hannah Ben Kahn is, I think, famous for. Um, probably the only center that I'm aware has done that is to do something like a mass credentialing and training for everybody in the department and just essentially um, go from doing no T to expect that everybody will do it. Um, that uh, seems a lot more challenging to me. It is definitely an approach. Uh, the way they did that it was by uh, credentialing with simulation only, so no, not really requiring any life uh, sort of uh, uh, scans. And uh, so that's the other approach. Um, that might not be the right approach you know, for you here, but those are the kind of the two ends of the spectrum. A lot of uh, places fall somewhere in between. My personal bias opinion is that as with any new thing, 
you want to have high quality in the rollout. You want to have sort of close supervision. Know about each one of those cases and ensure that you're doing a great job. Because it will only take, you know, a couple of sort of bad cases and can define that from many perspectives that will damage, you know, the potentially the program will will give argument to those that are going to maybe uh, try to you know put to assistance which will happen you know it's unfortunately part of anything new including the stethoscope and video endoscopy so i would say it makes sense in my mind intuitively to start small with a good thing you can control you can train really well um additionally i actually think that you want to come out of the gate with with a higher standard that, that you you know would would um that you would then set for the later phase of your of your implementations. For instance, for my group of faculty, I, I provided the, the equivalent training for advanced critical care echo in the beginning because I thought that that would be beneficial for them to be teachers, to for them to be the instructors essentially. So kind of like aspiring to a higher level of competency, get not just the minimum, but like actually better better training than that, so that they feel um uh you know, uh, say, uh, safe and, and, and confident to, to then uh, disseminate that knowledge. Um, so that's my my approach. Uh, and then key, uh, since we're here, since we're in the implementation phase, key to this, as with many other inventions, new technologies and, and applications, uh, funding allies and other departments, key allies, cardiovascular kinesiology, Sarah Nickelman, obviously great advocate and friend, fund somebody similar maybe um, in, in that department or in cardiology, uh, making them part of the program, involving them early in that training stage. Um, I think that just is the right, not just the right way to approach TV, I think that's just the right way to do medicine. Like that's what we should you know, do for everything. Uh, we should collaborate and, and seek support from sort of uh, specialties that have relevant skills. Yeah, I agree. I think that makes sense. Um, I have not done that in the past, but I think it makes sense to start like with a smaller set of uh, clinical locations, for instance, just cardiac arrest. Uh, that makes sense in some places. Uh, also, if you are detecting friction or like barriers or resistance, um, I think the argument that you're doing this only on dead patients and you're trying to make undead is 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 an easy one to make. Like, essentially. Nobody else cares about dead patients in the hospital. Nobody really else cares about cardiac arrest. Like we are the only ones that care about them. Um, and so there's no turf battles to be had uh, around, you know, procedures on dead patients. It's just, you know, sad and kind of good reality. Um, the reason why I didn't do it this way, that way, though, was because I've always thought that um, it, it is expanding like adding things after you implement is always tricky and um in, in my experience it made more sense to just establish very clearly what those indications were in the beginning and just make it very clear that not everybody would be using it for all those applications but i didn't want to restrict those champions and those people that were perfectly trained to do these procedures on patients with some of those other indications like procedural guidance, um, just because we had, you know, a subset of indications. Like I, I felt sort of ethically kind of um, uh, troubled by that idea that we were gonna have the modality there, but I was not going to offer it to the patient in front of me just because I didn't include it on the list. It just didn't make sense to me. This is what I need to quote my wife. Um, 
the so so yes, uh, obviously exactly that's the example with 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 ECMO. I think this is the reality with most procedures, right? Like any the way cath labs are started is where a couple of you know cardiologists just take you know take the the heat and and just literally live on call, like like. But it's just the way that many of these things need to be started. Um, it doesn't have to be a single, you know, one or one person show. But I think that there is a little bit of that. I think it makes sense to have a uh, small group. And if you have a small group, whether it's three, five, seven, you're never going to have enough to provide that like 24 seven coverage. So um, A, you need to make clear that this, that it would be a sort of case by case basis and the availability won't be insured or 24 seven. And I think that's the case probably with ECMO in the beginning in many cases, like you can say daytime hours or, you know, upon availability of faculty training. Um, that's the wording that I use in some of my credentialing uh, guidelines. But um, in the end, I think getting, in order to generate experience and to become good at it, you will need some of those people to just like literally be proactively seeking those um, and just being around, right? And, and I'm preaching to the choirs here because I, I know that you guys have done this um, with, with ECMO is the same. So I, I did that in my pen. I lived 10 minutes away and I was on call 24 seven for like two years. Um, Electively, but nobody you know, put me in that situation. But the benefit of that was that when I would come in, I would uh, not only be able to enroll those patients for our studies, but also I would be able to teach a few people in each of those studies, like guide, you know, have my one of our faculty do the study and just stand there, right? And like give them the confidence, help them troubleshoot the insertion or something. Um, so uh, I, I'd say there's probably no way around that. And just being creative and strategic about who those people can be. If you live an hour and a half away um, and bike into work, well, probably uh, that's not going to be a great solution. But maybe if if a few people within that group of champions is you know nearby and can be sort of activated, that's ideal. Another trick here in my advice. Another a great way to deal with this with availability is our colleagues, those allies upstairs. I'm a sociologist, some intensivist. Those people spend a lot more time than us in the hospital. Um, my, you know, intensive care colleagues will do 12-hour shifts. Uh, and sociologists will literally spend the entire day in the war or around the hospital in one call. So having them also be part of this uh, team that can activate it in the beginning, that makes so much sense to me if they're willing to be part of that. Um, that might be, you know, too big of an ask, depending on who those allies are, but um, I'm doing that at Cornell right now. We have a group of um, six or seven, including uh, four, three or four and sociologists and intensivists. And the chances that one of us is in the hospital any given time is actually like 100%. So it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. Thank you. When I trained almost 20 years ago, um, it was usually the, the people at the clinic that were doing the um, procedures were driving the patients, driving events and diagnostics, and more importantly, driving the patients with the technology. Uh, when I trained 20 years ago, we used an old radiology focus on machine, which really wasn't uh, the car for what we had to do. Uh, now, machines are very, very different. I wonder if uh, in your registry or in your work, you've gotten some insight as to how um, we can get away from using cardiologists to provide this. And are there things that would be could be optimized with the PEG as it is now that would benefit us to do that? Absolutely. Um, so there are point of care and systems already that have TE probes. Um, it is true that those TE probes are still kind of the same, but those that were developed originally for uh, comprehensive TE applications, whether it's operative or non-operative. Um, so there's definitely room for improvements in technology there. And um, I don't think it's a secret that a few of the companies, including the ones that I consult for, are working in developing better products that will be specifically designed for our applications that will have maybe like um, fewer, you know, fewer elements that would make them simpler, cheaper, um, perhaps more durable, less fragile. Um, so yes, there are opportunities to kind of customize and, and optimize the technology. At this point, we're still working with what was developed for uh, for comprehensive uh, T sort of 
um, applications. But the systems, the point of care system, the, the machines are the same that we use for our point of care applications. Um, yeah. Is that the, did I get that right? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, what a great way to start our grand round for the year.